Hi Booktube and welcome to my Books of the Year 2019. Well you've got a bit early haven't you Mark, it's only mid-December uh, and while that's true uh, I feel I can because uh, of the two books I'm currently reading neither of them will make the top ten and uh, the only other book I've got slated to read uh, which I'll be starting around the 18th of December is this little tome Duck's New Report by Lucy Elman and let's face it the chances of me finishing it before the end of the year to qualify for the chart are slim to none and it will probably just have to uh, enter next year's consideration. So uh, as I like to do I will start with a few reading stats for the year. I don't set Goodreads goals and targets and numbers of books I just read and see where I end up at the end of the year. So uh, I've read 128 books this year which I think is about 20 four up on last year. Of those, 105 were fiction, 23 were non-fiction. That's 82% fiction, 18% non-fiction, which is kind of what it, it around what it normally is. Uh, although I have to say non-fiction this year was boosted in November by non-fiction November, where I read five books. So it wouldn't be anything like that uh, without my first ever non-fiction November. And I'll post the link to that because it was quite a mixed bag. OK, so of the 105 fiction books, uh, two were short story collections because I'm still pretty much off short stories. And one of the two that I read, Italo Calvino's, I wasn't aware was short stories, but I love him so much I, you know, I, I sort of stuck to my task. And actually, it's not a bad collection. Um, there was one graphic novel uh, and there were five poetry of which... Three were read uh, in that sort of uh, short span between the end of Nonfiction November and my um, buddy read of Dante's Inferno. And um, what a superb uh, sort of selection of three they were. One of them makes my top ten, but uh, another one hovered just below uh, the top ten margin. So I had a really good sort of poetry experience this year. And again, I'll post the link to reviews of those three poetry collections I read in November, December. OK, and in terms of geography, uh, 34 were by UK authors, 32 by American and 39 by the rest of the world. So in percentage terms, very sort of close, 32% UK, 30% US and 37% rest of the world. And of the rest of the world, four from Argentina, four from Brazil, although three of those were Clarice Lispector. Uh, three were German, which were all Stefan Zweig. Uh, three from Croatia, including two by Dubravka Ugresic, three from France, two from Norway, two from Canada, two from Mexico, two from Ireland, and then uh, a selection of others, Australia, one from Australia, Nigeria, India, Syria, Colombia, Peru, and lots of European countries. So those were the stats. OK, and uh, before I go to my top ten, it is worth saying uh, my two uh, worst reads of the year. The first one was this, a debut novel by Yara Rodriguez Fowler called Stubborn Archivist. As you can possibly tell by her name, she's sort of Anglo-Brazilian. So sort of, you know, two different cultures feeding in, which is kind of what this book was about. But it was so boring. Nothing happened. It was just dull as ditch water. And actually, as I read, the, I read this, I suppose, in the first quarter of the year. And as the year wore on, it annoyed me more and more and more. So it wasn't my worst book even at the time I'd read it. But it just continued to annoy, annoy me just how... What a waste of time it was, really, which I don't really get from many reading experiences. And backs up my theory that uh, journalists who are bound by uh, column inch restrictions and pared down language really don't make for very good novelists where language is all. Um, yeah. And the other one, which uh, I've already unhauled, so you're going to have to look at the uh, cover. And I know this is a booktube darling. It's Ghost War by Sarah Moss which was a uh, terribly executed political themes, really clunkily done. Cardboard character cutouts in the supporting cast, including the racist, misogynist father, who was not even two-dimensional, but one-dimensional, um, and couldn't decide which ancient history and mythology its central metaphors were going to revolve around. Was it the Bronze Age and the Bog People, or was it the Romans and the Celts uh, in Scotland, the Picts, uh, with a sort of ghost wall of the title? And I would encourage, if any, any of its proponents and advocates 
decide they want to reread it. I would really be interested to know if they still felt as highly of this book um, as they did first time round, because I simply cannot understand, and maybe this is all me, how people could think, OK, you can think it's an OK book or a decent book, but to think it was one of the books of the year, and I know it got shortlisted for at least one prize, or longlisted for at least one prize, it's the only time I've ever found myself so out of step with the rest of Booktube. I think Britta Bowler didn't like it. I may, sorry Britta if I'm doing you an injustice. Anyway, those are the worst two books of the year for me. And you notice that it's two women and you might think, oh, here we go. Uh, but actually, you will find that the top three spots, the top my three favourite reads of the year, were all filled by female writers. Anyway, so uh, on to the top ten now. Because I read them this year, I would have reviewed them all this year on Booktube. So I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail on each one. I will post links to each of them in the show notes. I will post, uh, I will list them out of order. So it's not obvious what my top 10 is. So people can just go, oh, that's listed as first. That must be his top, his top book of the year. OK, so number 10, a debut novel by, called Riots I Have Known by Ryan Chapman, who is an American of Sri Lankan uh, origin. And uh, it's set in prison. Uh, it's a prison that has a new media wing has been built there. And uh, a man is bar a prisoner has barricaded himself in there during a riot. And he's sort of live reporting the riot on social media and talking about the personal threat that he will come under once the rioters reach where he is holed up. And he is the editor of the in-house prison creative writing magazine which has started to get uh, a lot of play and interest outside of the prison walls. It's a bit of a sort of literary sort of cultural phenomenon because these are prisoners right, telling it how it is. Uh, and it's very, very funny. It's very flip and hip and, and witty. The, the only problems I had with it is I couldn't, you know, the two things you kind of want to know is why is someone going to come in after him and what is he in prison for in the first place? And we're never told. There's a lot of teasing about them, but we're never really revealed. So I felt, uh, you know, a bit bereft by the end. But it is a very enjoyable, speedy, funny read. And on to number nine, Old Baggage by Lissa Evans. I know Sean the Bookman yet didn't like this. I think he bailed. But, I, you know, I really enjoyed this. This is sort of asking the question, what happens after you have been politically active in a movement... You've achieved your aim to some extent with legis legislative change. What do you do next? Where does all that energy go? And a lot of people go back to their normal lives because they've achieved what they wanted to achieve. But the main character in here still has all this energy coursing through, all this spirit of resistance and opposition. And, you know, she has to find an outlet for it. And uh, the political cause in this case was the coming together of women for the suffrage. Uh, that has been concluded... So what, you know, what do they all do now? And this woman sort of starts as sort of, I suppose, a female, not girl guides, it's a bit sort of more like adventure scouts, where she's sort of training and mentoring girls. Um, and one of her former comrades uh, is doing similar, and he hers is a sort of fascist youth league. So there's a lot of politics in it, but actually I thought the characters were well drawn. She was really spunky and spiky, the main character, but she's flawed and makes a terrible error of judgment. And I just thought this was a really all-round good book. Number eight, The Idiot by Elif Batuman. Now, I saw a lot of complaints about this. It was long-listed for, I think, the Women's Prize or one of the prizes last year. And I saw a lot of complaints around it at the time. It's too long. It could do with cutting and editing. That it sort of meanders to no good effect. And I disagree with that. Yes, it meanders, Absolutely. Uh, it's a character who is just starting at university in America. She doesn't know anyone. So it's all about those, how she forms social networks, which are completely random. Obviously, people she's in class with, her roommates, which she chooses not to become particular friends with because she doesn't have anything in common with them. But it's that sort of, how do we make relationships with, you know, starting from scratch? And the other thing it is, it's about language and trying to communicate. And I thought that was the real strength of this book. So my biggest problem with the books I've read this year is there are so many books that I call stoner books, by which I mean the characters meander around, slightly strange, absurd or, or surreal events happen around them, less strange and surreal if they're actually, you know, smoking spliff, 
but a lot of these books are not smoking smith they still have these sort of slightly strange encounters and there's no core to these books there's no root to these books this has the similar superficial thing of a meandering character going from relationship and encounter to encounter an event but it ties it together because it is a study of how we form net social networks in the flesh and also the difficulty of communications we all speak the same language and yet we don't and just to give you an example of many of the books i read uh, as i say the, what i call stoner novels uh michael chabon's the wonder boys which was a stoner novel but even joy williams's book uh the quick and the dead um sam lipsight's hark they're just too many of these books sort of you know description of so-called funny events to no real purpose anyway let's get away from the point so elif batterman the idiot um number eight number seven plume by will wiles who's a british author now this is an interesting book because there's something i really didn't like about it and it overcame that with the rest of the book to still get in my top 10 so I think that's quite an achievement really the central character is an alcoholic and i don't really like reading about alcoholics a because i have seen it at first hand uh, the addictive personality albeit it wasn't with alcohol in the case of one of my parents um so i'm fully aware of the psychology although i will say it was well done i mean it's faithful to the experience that i had of observing it but the second reason is uh that i didn't i don't really appreciate that is i'm not sure it makes it a very particular viewpoint which is obviously any character in a novel has a very particular viewpoint but i felt that worked against the rest of the novel so the novel is basically about london and it's about the changing nature of london's architecture as things get spruced up for you know old old slums get uh, um gentrified and commercialized uh but also the, the sort of the, the the geolocation of london as you can sort of follow people on your phone where they are or they tell you where they are all that sort of stuff and it was really really well done and it also nodded i think to jonathan leatham's chronic city which is the book about new york doing similar things to new york where uh, the main character's house subs um falls you know falls collapses and falls to the ground which was happening in 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 leatham's new york and there's a reason for that and i just thought this was you know two-thirds of a fabulous book you know if it didn't have an alcoholic character at its heart i you know this would have gotten to much higher echelons i think of my top 10 charts so i think a really interesting book for me personally in that it overcomes its deficiencies by the rest of the book being so good uh, i think it also uh acknowledged uh, the book alphabet city by the guy who wrote peaky blinders i can't remember his name now um in that um there's a sort of a fake, you know, a writer who became well known for his book on East London in, in, in here. You know, is it fake? Did he make it all up, presenting it as, as you know, a sociological study? That is very much like Alphabet City, again, uh, set in New York. So there was a lot of resonance to me in this book. You know, it touched those with books that I really like and admire. I'm not saying Wiles, you know, overtly took from these books, but that's what they, how they resonated with me. So book number six and the second last or the third last novel that I read this year. And what a pleasant surprise this was. Travelling in a Strange Land by the Northern Ireland established author that I'd never heard of before called David Park. And, I, you know, I was in a sort of um, a vein of reading books by Northern Irish writers. So I ordered this as part of that. And then I sort of reread the blurb when it arrived and thought, oh, actually, this is going to be bog standard family drama. I'm not that interested. So I kept relegating it, relegating it, relegating it to my, my TBR. And it wasn't getting read. And then I had a, some, some commuting to do on a Saturday. So I picked up because it was short and I thought I'd read this. I couldn't get to any, I couldn't commit to any longer books because I was about to enter my Dante uh, read along. Um, and this was wonderful. I mean, this really was such a pleasant surprise. I mean, it's basically the story of uh, a father living in Northern Ireland during a heavy snowstorm uh, that grounds all the aeroplanes. And his son is at university in, in the northeast of England, but he's sick, he's got flu. And so the father's going to pick him up by, via ferry and then car to bring him back home for Christmas so he's not alone and ill over Christmas. So that, that's the premise. Beautifully written, beautiful metaphors. 
And it reminded me of that film Lock by, with Tom Hardy because it's basically a guy in his car ruminating. There are a few interactions with other people outside, but that's basically it. And he's asking questions such as, you know, is it possible to have a fulfilling life in a conventional marriage? Uh, the responsibilities of parenting and children that parents will, you know, do, will, are they slated inevitably to fail their children? Um, and all that sort of stuff. And it's just beautifully controlled, modulated, the pace of it. And, you know, I was utterly won over by, by this book. OK, so on to the top five. David Markson, Reader's Block. So this is David Markson, who is my probably favourite author. And this is very much in the, in the sort of shtick of his uh, other novels that I, I love and behold, which is probably why... It's not high, you know, if I hadn't read a David Markson book before I read this, this would be in my top three. But, you know, I, I know what, you know, the cards he's dealing for the pack with this. Having said that, it is still a supreme work of art and artistry and artifice to some extent. So uh, there is a read, there is a character called Reader, who is a writer. Uh, and he is struggling to start his next book. He's sort of caught on the horns of two dilemmas as to where to set it. He's got two different places in mind, but he can't reconcile which one, and whether he should bring in real-life characters from the author's life, or in this case, reader's life, into the story. And the reason he can't get past this is because the weight of his reading through life has given him too much choice. He can't select, he can't edit it down. There's just too much stuff to consider and he never really gets off the starting block. Having said that, in typical Markson style, alongside the little uh, sort of statements from the author, who was called Reader, is, you know, factlets, epigrams, bits of criticism, quotes from real life people, uh, which just move in along and point at his uh, themes, the obsessions. And you quickly realise that there's, you know, this is working on three levels. There's the character called Reader, who is an author, but there's also David Markson, and there's the characters that, of the book. And at various points, you're not sure, you know, you're fairly sure that when Reader says something, it applies to both his characters, but also to the real author, David Markson. So, for example, one of the fact that's quoted is that Balzac on his deathbed cried out for the Doctor, who was not a real Doctor, but a Doctor character from one of his books, thereby, you know, that thing about merging fact with fiction, the fact that writers are writers 24-7, and it, you know, it possesses them even to the very end, where he confuses real life with it, with his past writings, all that sort of stuff. It's just a brilliant, subversive book that very quietly and in small ways asks very big questions. Supreme. So number four is uh, one of the works of poetry uh, that I spoke about and the one that made it to my top five. This is called Transcript by Heinrich Bakker, who's an Austrian, was an Austrian. And this is the most remarkable attempt to bring voice to the Holocaust because people sort of say the Holocaust is unspeakable you can't really express it because of the scale etc etc which is true but but this has the best stab at it because it is using the words of those who process the Holocaust and its victims so it's you know medical Nazi doctors who did experiments it's the bureaucrats who ran the train system it's the prison guards and the torturers. It's Nazi ideologues. Uh, it is sort of the police who had to sort of, you know, enact the Nazi, each sort of Nazi uh, bylaw, you know, gradually stripping Jews of their status. It is victims of the Holocaust in their own words, but very small snatches. And what it shows is we say it's unspeakable. But clearly it wasn't because the people prosecuting the Holocaust were speaking about it, were writing about it, were producing reports on it or putting in figures of people transported or people gassed and all this sort of stuff, or the people who were shot in, in the sort of satellite republics of the Soviet Union, you know, by the death squads, uh, partly of locals, partly of, of German Nazis. And it is chilling and remarkable but it does it does give you an insight as to how human beings could go down that which has always been the great question you know how can human beings 
perform these you know inhuman acts and Hannah Arendt theorizing the banality of evil and here you get an insight as to just what that means how bureaucrats can process you know the movement of human cargo to, to their death and things like that and the language is very varied it's bureaucratic it's political it's medical scientific it's epigrammatic uh, it's euphemistic it's coded uh, some of the sort of the political, the sort of political ideology is just gibberish and comes over as gibberish. It's poignant of the people you know who are dying in the camps as they sort of write on the walls their final messages, etc., etc., etc. This is just extraordinary piece of work. And it, you know, it's short. The extracts are very short. You know, sort of pages could look like that. And then there's a thing at the back which explains the source of each each one and what it means. So when you've got just got a list of figures such as and when you've got something like that which is it, which is just a load of sort of you know looks like gibberish it's it, when you go to the back and see what it is you see that these are the uh the anacronyms of the, each of the death camps you know reduced to three letters so they're sort of partially hidden from foreign eyes kind of thing it's just extraordinary okay so on to the top three in third place, Annie Erno, The Years, which was long-listed for the Women's Prize, I think. Uh, no, it was the Booker International. It was, it was short or long-listed for. And I do not like memoir. And as you can tell by this being Fitzcarraldo white cover rather than blue, Fitzcarraldo didn't market it as fiction. They marketed it as, you know, non-fiction memoir, effectively. But this is a brilliant memoir where I becomes we because this is the memoir of Annie Ernaux from, you know, post-war childhood through to the 2000s and in her sort of late middle age, but told through the cultural, social and political history of France during that entire period. So Annie Ernaux, the I, is very much playing second fiddle to the uh, the the prominent uh, character that is the country of France. So it starts off with post-war austerity, moving into the new uh, sort of consumerism and how fresh produce was replaced by pre-packaged stuff and the shops, the nature of the food shops change into supermarkets. You get the sort of the post, the anti-colonialist movement as Algeria and Vietnam, you know, were, were released uh, with great difficulty. You get the hope of socialism in the 80s with Mitterrand and how that let everybody down, etc, etc, etc. It is so brilliantly done. And the funny thing was, I'm not French, obviously, I grew, I grew up in France's neighbour, Britain, but I also lived through a lot of this. Not the specific uh, politics of France, although Britain's was to some extent similar in some ways, but in terms of the social and cultural changes, they're not dissimilar in Britain. Uh, and I recognise a lot of this. I mean, she's probably a little older than I am, given that she was talking about post-war austerity. But, um, yeah, supreme. Number two, Clarice Lispector, The Passion According to G.H. So I read three Lispector novels this year. I have two left to read next year, and then I've read all of her novels. And uh, I, this was a buddy read with Cillian. and I think we did it around February, March time. And it left us both breathless. We set a pace of 25 pages a day in a book that's 188 pages. 25 pages a day, you think, oh, that's quite sort of a modest, moderate target. But actually, it, it, it was spot on because I had never read a book as intense as this because the spectre works at the level of the sentence, not the level of the plot or the level of the chapter. She is packs more into since every single sentence than any other writer I know. I was saying this was so intense. Basically, the story is uh, a woman in Brazil. Uh, her maid has left. We don't know if she sacked her or she's left of her own accord. So the woman uh, goes into the maid's room to basically, you know, clean it up for the next incumbent. But it's already been sort of cleaned up, except for a drawing on the wall. And she notices uh, a cockroach is making its way across the cupboard. And she shuts the door of the cockroach and sort of sort of crunches it and the whole book is a meditation on her relationship to life death art god love based on these simple elements of the room uh the the squash cockroach 
and it veers from you know one pole to another within a couple of sentences on each meditation it is so vertiginous but in a good way you know Clarice respect her I put her in my top authors uh, in my top five because I've never read a bad book by Clarice Inspector and even though Agua Viva and what was the other one um, can't remember but even though they were good this is a, another level altogether and as I say Sue and I needed to recover after reading this book it's so poleaxed us with its brilliance and on to number one, uh, well, you know, no surprise here because I've trailed it ever since I read it in June. Everyone uh, who follows my channel knows that I said for a long time this was unlikely to be knocked off the number one spot. And indeed, that is the case. The Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli, which made the longest of the Women's Prize and also the, uh, the Booker Prize long list. And I have never read a book so beautifully portraying the real nature of relationships between parents and children. So ostensibly, it is a road trip movie, a uh, movie, road trip book of a blended family of a man and his son and a woman and her daughter, and the man and the wife have married. They're driving from New York down to Arizona. The man, because he wants to sort of visit and record the, the, the silence and the void vacated by the Apaches, and the woman, because she uh, wants to uh, explore, also as a sound recordist, uh, the children, the undocumented children who come over from uh, Latin America across the border illegally, and some disappear never to be seen again in the deserts of Arizona and Texas. And so it is about, about you know, vanishing people, missing people, migration, forced migration, exile. It is, that is all in there. But for me, the, the, you know, an even greater strength was the relationship between, you know, the two kids sat in the back day after day after day or in a motel and mainly the mother. The father chips in now and again, but it's really between the mother uh, and the great tragedy. You know, the lost children, not only the lost uh, Apache children, the lost Latin American children. They're about to be these two children in the back because the family is breaking apart. And because they're, you know, they come from with different parents, they will be split up, which is so tragic because the bond between the son and the, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the son and the daughter, brother and sister, is so beautiful. And it's a real tragedy. You know, I don't normally have an emotional reaction to books, but I did to that at the prospect of these two being torn from one another forever. But there's also fantastic um, stylistic and formalistic elements so when they set out when they set out on their trip they pack nine boxes uh, the parents have uh, seven and the kids have one each and the kids is as empty and the idea is they will pick up things on the journey to fill those boxes the parents are more things about you know things to do with their projects like book key books and text key recordings all that sort of stuff and that all these boxes are gradually listed their items throughout the book but it's only at the end of the book that you get the the the, the two kids boxes and it's so poignant what on the journey they have put into those boxes it's beautiful it is it is such a beautiful heart-rending book and you know this will get into my all-time top 10, uh, you know, when Jason uh, over at uh, Old Blues Chapter Verse asked us to, to do them, submit them. But obviously, this hadn't been published then, so it wasn't in it. It would definitely get in it now. So there you have it. Just a quick recap. Number one, Valeria Luiselli. Number two, Clarice Lispector. Number three, Annie Ernaux, representing a clean sweep for women writers in the top three. Four is Heimrad Bakker. Five, David Markson. Six, David Park, a new author to me. Seven, Will Wiles, a new author to me. Eight, Elish Batuman. Nine, Lissa Evans. And ten, Ryan Chapman. So there you have it, Booktube. Uh, please let me know uh, what you think of any of those books. Uh, or indeed what you think of Ghost Wall and The Stubborn Archivist, if you've had the misfortune to read those two books. So uh, I know I've gone early, but I'm going to wish you all a happy festive period and, and maybe some reading around the fine cheer of food and wine and family and uh, sporting events at uh, Christmas is and uh, here's to 2019 till next sorry here's till 2020 here's to next year thanks very much <laughs>